Our next speaker is Mr. Meni Barzile, Chief Security Evangelist, Uniken Israel. He will be providing a global perspective on cybersecurity. He will be followed by Mr. Karthik Shinde, cybersecurity leader at Ernst & Young India, who will showcase the findings of the Ernst & Young Global Information Security Survey Report 2014. First, please join me in welcoming Mr. Meni Barzile. Hi, do you hear me? Wow, okay, thank you for having me. Thank you for staying here. I know it's been a long day. Um, I'm gonna do it, hopefully I'm gonna do it interesting. We're gonna talk about cybersecurity. Surprising, isn't it? Um, I'm so excited being here. I'm so excited being in India. I love India. Um, I love the people, I love the food. I'm having so, I meet so much intelligent people, so many intelligent people here. I have so many intelligent discussions here. I learned so much, so uh, thank you for having me uh, again. So we, will go, we are gonna talk about cyber security, right? Um, but let's start somewhere else. So Heraclitus, he was a Greek philosopher. Um, he coined the phrase, the only constant in life is change, right? And we know that. We know that the only constant in life is change. Actually, when we wake up in, in the morning, we discover that we woke up to a different world. The first thing that most of us is doing is just we are reaching out to our phone to check what have changed during the night, what happened during the night, because the, ra the rate of change is so high. And we feel that sometimes it's hard to keep uh, what's going on, right? So, and we see those amazing innovations, amazing technology innovations uh, are being uh, introduced to the market. Crazy things that if we have seen them in movies, we would have said that, no, this cannot be, this is not real. But suddenly they become reality. This is a bus station, right? And this is crazy. But before we'll talk about the future, let's for a minute talk about the past. Let's make um, the 50 million users test. So, how much time did it took the TV to reach 50 million users? About 13 years. How much time it took the radio? About 38 years. How much time for the telephone? About 75 years. How much time for Angry Birds? About 38 days. So the rate of change is actually increasing. And this is amazing, this is crazy. There are a lot of people today we don't know how a tape cassette is related to a pencil, right? Everybody here knows that we use it, right? And that was just a minute ago. That was just a minute in time. And now nobody knows what a tape cassette is. Sometimes they don't even know what a pencil is. And that's crazy. So this is a talk about cybersecurity. Um, we hear a lot about cybersecurity. We read a lot about cybersecurity. And sometimes we feel that it's too much, right? Maybe it's a peak of an era. Maybe it's too much cybersecurity. But the truth about cybersecurity is very simple. It's, um, cybersecurity is about change. Change equals to new opportunities plus new threats. And that's that. That's the most important thing. Those are two sides of the same coin. With every new technology that we will see, with every new uh, innovative change that we will see, we will have new risks. And this means that we'll have much more work to do um, because the next decade is going to be an amazing decade with regarding to uh, technology, right? So if we take the boat, when the man invented the boat, it created a whole new uh, landscape of opportunities, but obviously new risks. Nobody have thought about creating the security measures to actually uh, cope with those risks. Um, the same happened when we, introduced, uh, we were introduced with the iPhone. It created a whole new type of opportunities, but also, obviously, new threats. Um, so this is also a talk about the future. And someone once said that it's difficult to make predictions, uh, especially about the future. And, right, so we know that we cannot know what's going to happen. But if you ask this guy, if you ask a prof professional uh, sport athlete, um, for example, a hockey player, where do you go if you want to catch the puck? He always says, 
I'm going to the place where I think the puck is going to be and not where it is right now. So this is how we should measure our risk. We should also always try to understand where things are going. Um, this is a very important tool in order to manage risks, right? So we need to, be, to make sure that we're not sitting with our back to the train. We have to be proactive. The rate of change is so high, we cannot sit and wait for things to happen. We have to act and we have to act now. Again, we'll take this coin with those two sides and we will put it in our toolbox because we are going to use it soon. Um, I had to choose the topics that we're going to talk about today and it was hard because there are so many amazing things happening in the cyber world. But I chose to speak about the things that I feel that are the most practical things, the things that we are actually have to do something about them, right? Not like five to 10 years from now, but 2015, 2016, and 17. So the first thing that we're gonna talk about is the cloud. And this is, the cloud is all news, right? Everybody talked about the cloud. Um, banks are still struggling with incorporating their technology with the cloud, right? Um, but I always say to people, the question about cloud is not if we will use it, is when, either now or later. Cloud is a definite future. Everyone is going to use it. Um, why? Because it makes sense, right? It's cost effective. But people are f they f feel that it's a little problem to go to the cloud because it's a, it's a matter of tr a trust. You want to make sure that if you jump, someone will catch you. And with those vendors, you don't always feel that. The loss of trust is a very big issue. And we could have had a different talk just about the loss of trust. And this is a very important issue. But again, uh, cloud is cost effective. We will see people moving to the cloud. Cloud is more secure, basically saying. Um, but here is a, uh, an important thing. Now remember this. The attack probability, the probability that you will be hacked, is a function of the incentive to hack inside your organization. And this is, this is very important truth, right? And this is probably the most scary thing about cloud computing, because we all took our data and put it in one place. This means that we're all on the same boat. That also means that if someone has an incentive to attack this guy, this guy can also be attacked. So suddenly, we are all being uh, um, hacked together, right? And this is a big problem with the cloud. I think that we will see in the next two years one of those big vendors being hacked. And some, uh, some major issues will be with cloud, and we will have to do a leapfrog with security in clouds. So the next thing is the Internet of Things. I don't like this trend. People always talk about, talk about Internet of Things. I don't like this trend because it's a mega trend. If I ask a person, what is Internet of Things, there is no definite answer. If we want to be practical about Internet of Things, we have to, do, uh, we have to divide this trend to uh, real trends, like uh, smart houses, wearable, driverless, driverless cars, and so on and so on. So let's talk about those. But if we want to talk about those trends, we have to put another tool in our toolbox, which is standardization equals increased incentive, which means that if everyone is using the same solution, the incentive to attack that solution is actually increasing. Uh, we will see that with, uh, uh, for many years, Internet Explorer was a favorite uh, um, uh, target for hackers because everybody used it. Uh, Windows is a favorite attack, um, uh, target for hackers because everybody uses it. Um, so this is a very important rule. Um, we, already also, sorry, we are already seeing smart TVs everywhere, right? But because they are very different from one another and there is no standardization in smart TVs, we will not see many hacks in those uh, machines. There is a guy that created this wonderful presentation in Black Hat two years ago where he showed how we can actually hack into a smart TV. But this will not become a commercial hacking because there is no standardization. So let's talk about that. Smart houses. We already saw hacking related to smart houses. This nanny, uh, she had this baby to take care of, and suddenly, and she used this baby monitor. Do you know what baby monitor is, right? It's the camera and the microphone, and she can sit in another room, and she can see the 
the baby, and suddenly she hears voices from this baby monitor. This guy says, wow, that's a cute baby, but this diaper, I, I don't like it. And those strange noises. And then she discovers that someone hacked into this baby monitor. But again, this is not a big issue for us in the, in the next two years. We shouldn't take care of it, even though we're seeing that this is possible, this will not become a commercial issue. Um, with uh, regards to heavy machinery and robots, again, in 1981, there was a robot that actually killed a person. Um, um, I guess that the robot didn't mean to do that, but we actually saw that. This is not going to be a major issue in the next few years. Uh, biotech, wow, biotech. This is a sexy issue, right? Everybody is talking about hackers that can actually hack into the human's body and kill you from the distance, uh, hack into insulin pump, hack into pacemakers, right? Did you see the TV series? Um, um, what's the name of this TV series? Uh, nobody saw it. Okay, so Homeland, right? Homeland. In this TV series, you see a scenario where someone hacked into the vice president's pacemaker and kills him. So this is a very sexy thing, but again, we will probably not see that in the next two years. We don't need to be bothered with that. Driverless cars, again, sexy, but not relevant. We're staying with wearables. Wearables is very, very important. Um, because we are moving, and this is, listen carefully, we are moving from a world where everything is always off, and you turn it on when you want to use it, to a world where everything is always on. And if you don't want to use it, you have to turn it off, right? This means that we are becoming much more, much better at collecting information. So um, we will wear more and more things, and those things will collect all the information about us all the time. The issue about privacy is going to raise again because of wearables. And, but because wearables is a fashion thing, right? So you don't just use a, a, a watch, a smartwatch. You want to choose the specific smartwatch that actually fits your uh, uh, fashionable identity. We will see some struggling with regards to um, standardization in wearables. Nevertheless, we will, we will might not see a direct damage, but we will definitely see an indirect damage regarding to wearables. That means that because those companies become much better at collecting information, the incentive to attack them actually increases. So we will see those companies being hacked more and more. So assume you're, you, you've been hacked. Why? Because it makes sense. So there is a lot of incentive to hack into uh, the CEO's phone or the chairman's phone or any other's phone that sits in this board meeting because if you do that, A, it's very easy, and B, you actually gain a lot. If you sit in those meetings and you hear what's happening there, uh, you gain a lot. So just assume you've been hacked because it makes sense. Um, even though I said that the driverless car will not be hacked in the next few years, there, there is a scenario that we might see, because this is, this is a tipping point with regards to driverless cars, right? Humanity is going to change a lot due to this technology. It's going to change everything, this technology. And because this is a tipping point, this is a very sexy um, target for hackers. So we might see some hackers trying to attack us. Uh, so Internet of Things basically means more potential target, which will mean more hacking. The next thing is big data. Again, old news, right? But we are just started understanding how to use big data. At some point, humanity, real, humanity realized that we, are, we became much better at creating information, at creating data, than actually analyzing it. So we try to create those new tools to actually mitigate this gap, the gap, uh, gap and we called it big data. So those tools actually allow us to analyze a big amount of data. And we are just started understanding the potential of this. Um, there is so much information about us, about our families, about our uh, organizations. And the people who will know how to actually utilize this information, this is a superpower. They will be super strong. So big data is going to be a very efficient attack tool. Remember that. Uh, even though many companies actually publish information and they say, don't worry, we actually anonymized it, right? So they publish this information, they said, we anonymized it. We know that they don't really care about other 
organizations that actually published information. And even though the information you published is pretty much anonymized, together with the all other information that was published, you can actually discover uh, who published what and about who. So this is, if you don't know this incident, you should definitely read about it. This is a Netflix incident. Um, they actually published something about half a million records about their users. Um, and they had this competition saying, if you can devise an algorithm that will help us uh, guess which movies our users want to see, like based on the movies that they already saw, we will pay you $1 million, because this is very important. If you can do that, you can create more and more business. And right after they published this, uh, this, uh, those half a million records, this woman, which is a lesbian, she actually sues Netflix for releasing her information, because she says, now, with all the information that's available on the internet, people can actually know that I'm, that I'm lesbian. Um, how did she uh, uh, arrive at this uh, uh, conclusion? Because, obviously, not, she actually published her information not only on Netflix, she also uses uh, IMDb and Facebook, and if she writes there some of the movies that she saw, together with the information in Netflix, people can actually um, understand which movies she saw, and from that, reach to the conclusion that she's lesbian. And obviously, the 4chan uh, event with the models is the same, using information that is publicly available to attack. So what is the sense about asking you what's your pet name if most of people actually hold Facebook accounts for, the, for their pets? So this information is available. This security question is not very strong anymore. The next thing is the banking industry, the BFSI, actually. So the BFSI is the hottest party in town. And this is very important to understand. Everybody want to go in. Everybody's waiting in line to go into this party. And we see their unconventional competitors. And we see their startup companies that are trying to create new ways to do banking. And we see their Apple and Facebook and Google. And everybody want to go into this party and be part of that. And we will see amazing innovation in the banking industry, in the BFSI. Uh, but remember, two sides of that coin. That means that we will be introduced with a many new threat scenarios. Attack probability as equals to, is a function of incentive, as a function of incentive. And there is no better incentive for a most than money. Money is an amazing incentive. This is why we will see amazing new threat scenarios are being introduced. So if we are using new technologies, if we are using, implementing new security technologies, we need them to be a team player. We need them to work with us to protect us from those threats. We cannot use those uh, technologies that says, no, don't do that. We need those business enabler technologies that will help us, help us protect our business. Bitcoin is amazing. We could have had a presentation just about Bitcoin. I could have talked about Bitcoin for three hours. This is amazing. Um, when analyzing Bitcoin, and I meet a lot of banks, and we have uh, many, a lot of talks about Bitcoin, um, there is a problem with the way banks actually address Bitcoin. So if you actually try to analyze this issue, I encourage you to do this. Write this. Threats on one side, opportunities on the other, and business on one side, and technology on the other. And try to analyze Bitcoin in those, the, those four uh, uh, areas, right? So someone told me that the fact Bitcoin is anonymized, you can do uh, anonymized uh, transactions, is a business threat. But it's not a business threat. The anonymization inside Bitcoin is a property. And we should actually analyze this product, uh, property in all of the sorry, all of those areas, and try to understand what does it means. We will see more fraud, and we will see more crimeware, uh, sorry, ransomwares. Are, are you uh, familiar with the concept of ransomware? If you do, please raise your hand, just to better understand. Okay, so I will tell you what ransomware is. So you have this virus, it actually attacks your computer, and it encrypts all the information inside this computer. And you receive this message saying, either you will pay us, or and we will give you, if you will pay us, we will give you the password to open those files, or in 10 days, this computer is gonna <clears throat> be deleted. 
And it actually really works. If you pay them many times, they send you a password, and if you uh, use this password, your computer is, being, uh, is actually being unlocked. And if you don't do that, after 10 days, you cannot use your computer anymore. And we saw a rise in ransomware five years ago, and then it almost vanished. But again, we see rise again because of Bitcoin. Because suddenly, you can pay to those attackers using Bitcoin, and it, we see that more and more and more. So the basic principles on which we build in the information security world are actually being uh, destroyed. We trusted a lot of things that today we understand we cannot trust anymore. So we trusted SSL, right? We trusted certificates. We trusted two-factor authentication. We trusted vendors. We trusted hardwares. We trusted so many things. But today we understand that we need to regain trust using innovative solutions, using things that are recreating trust. Um, any way to connect inside the organization means new vulnerability. And we have to protect those vulnerabilities. We will see more and more organization being attacked using those devices, using the, 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 the way that employees are using, the way that vendors are using. Um, we will see many organizations being attacked like that. Uh, the last thing I want to talk to you about with regards to the landscape, uh, threat landscape, is that I gave a talk at RSA conference uh, in 2014, the last one, the next one is gonna be in a few weeks. Um, I talked about the fact that private companies are being attacked by uh, states, right? So private companies like banks are being attacked by states. And I encourage you, if you are interested about this topic, I encourage you to go to the internet and search for my name and spies inside uh, Facebook, and you will see the presentation. I don't want to go inside that. But just to say that North Korea and Sony Entertainment, this is an amazing example of a company being attacked by states, and suddenly uh, Sony finds itself between the United States and North Korea, um, a commercial company that, know, that don't know how to act in this game, right? Um, security by design is probably the most important concept if you're doing, if you're creating your product and only then creating security, it will not work. If you really want to create a good product, always create a security by design. This is the most important uh, concept. So we will see those uh, old technologies, SCADA mainframes, um, are being attacked because they don't have security by design. Um, the, the borderline between the physical world and the virtual world. So once upon a time, we had a clear divisions. We had things that were belonged to the physical world, right? A car, a gate, a house. And we had things that belong to the virtual world, right? So an email, uh, um, a virus, Facebook. But suddenly, more and more things are being, um, are, uh, are actually positioned on the middle. So cars today are actually, and we talked about that, are computer-based. There, there are actually more than 100 co uh, computers inside a car. That means that this asset, the same car, actually lives in both worlds. It's all, all, this car exists in the physical world as well as in the virtual world. That means that if I want to attack this car, I can do it from both places, right? And I can hurt the driver from both places. And we have the people who are in charge of protecting us in the physical world. And we have the people who are in charge of protecting us in the virtual world. But who's in charge of understanding the, the whole picture? Who's in charge of understanding threats that are starting from the virtual world and moving to the physical world or the other way around? Um, for example, with a bank, there is a, a, a security center that if um, someone will break into a branch, the security center will receive this alert saying uh, someone has broke into a branch. And if someone connected a device into a computer, we have a different uh, security center that will say someone actually connected the device. And this is the same event. But because physical world and virtual world are separate in the way that we actually protect them, those guys will not know that this is the same event. So where do we go from here? What do we need to do? Remember this, we don't need to talk about the threats today. We need to talk about the threats of tomorrow. Use our toolbox to actually try to analyze what's gonna happen to your organization. Be innovative. Attackers have no rules. They can do whatever they want. They are super creative. They are very innovative. We have to be as much as innovative as they are, if not more than that. 
Regulation is great. So regulations create actually a great baseline, but it's not enough. We have to do much more than what uh, regulations require, right? Um, we have to simplify our technology. This is a big problem today. We have this complicated technology environment and it's hard for us to understand where are the risks. So we need to simplify our technology. Um, the gap between the ability to, at to attack and the ability to protect actually increases. This is very important. It's if you are attacking, you have to succeed one time. If you are protecting, you have to succeed all the time. Attacking costs less money than protecting. Protecting is a very expensive thing. There are no rules for attacking, a lot of rules for protecting. If you are attacking, you can attack one point. If you are protecting, you have to protect on everything. Attacking is exciting. Protecting is considered routine. Uh, attacking is very innovative. Protecting is very predictable. We have to change that. We have to change the way we do security. Um, we asked ourselves in the past, right? In the past, we asked ourselves, can we be hacked? And this was a very important question. And obviously, we wanted the answer to be no. So what did we do? We created this firewall that will keep the bad guys outside and the good guys inside. And then we were so happy, so we created more firewalls to keep the users on one side and the server in, uh, servers on the other side. And we created more firewalls, and we created more firewalls, and we were so happy with that. But today we understand that this is not enough. We have to ask a different question, right? We have to have the courage to ask this question. What should we do if someone does hack us? This is a question that will require us to be more courageous. And we understand that today we cannot invest only in prevention. We have to, prevent, uh, to, we have to invest also in detection. Because detection is a war in which we can win. Actually, detection is a war in which we have the lead. We can do better. Um, so if you are actually choosing a security um, device, a security application, whatever you do, always choose a solution that gives you a good detection capabilities, that give you good logs, that give you ability to connect it to your SIEM and SOC center. Um, create a um, uh, logging and monitoring strategy work together. This is, this is a super important slide, even though it's not that beautiful. It's a super important slide. Work together. So the guys on the threat side actually work together. They know how to share knowledge. They know how to share tools. They know how to cooperate. We cannot manage our security by silos and saying, this is our organization. We're going to protect it. Everybody else should take care of their own assets. It's not going to work in the near future. If we really want to do something great and something good, we have to work together. We have to start by actually being courageous, again, about that, and share information. This is probably the first step. This is the easiest step. Those kind of conferences are very important in the, in the way that we talk to each other. We create a discussion. So share information. Share information about new technologies. Share information about new threats. Share information about things that actually happened to you. And I know this is hard. Organizations don't like to share this kind of information. Share information about things that actually help you to cope with this threat. Do this. This is very important. Be smart about this. Yeah, I know, stupid. And use technology in a wise way, right? So this is my message to you. Please feel free to keep in touch. Take our card, uh, create a discussion. If you have questions, do we have some time for questions? Yeah, no? 40 minutes? No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, no? It's up to you. Anyone want to ask something? Three, two, one, no. Great. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited being here. Thank you, Lisa.